I always like to listen to another poet for the first time and recognize that so often for many poets, it is a concatenation of events or recognition of that concatenation that eventuates in a poem. By that, I mean serendipity. A serendipity and epiphanic motions of the heart and world together. Um, it's a pleasure to, to hear you, and I enjoyed it very much. I'm looking very much forward to Dr. Strauss. An, an epiphany occurred just today. I was sitting with a friend looking at a yearbook from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, where I served as physician in Vermont. It's the oldest writers' conference, and I had the great privilege of serving as the physician for that writers' conference for three summers. I got to the end of the book, and there in 1970, one of the scholars was Thomas Lux. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> I want to uh, read a few short poems about uh, a trip to the Middle East. There's so much going on in the Middle East now, and uh, I think that I shall never be able to take the kind of uh, trip that I took in 1998. I was the sole physician uh, for this group of theology students who were going first to Damascus and Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and, and Israel and ended up in Jerusalem. Um, of course, everyone on the trip got sick, and they did not get sick in a cardiac way. Uh, but I was the only physician, and uh, so I began after a while to feel like the plague doctor. You remember, he was dressed up in this leather costume with gloves and a stick with which he felt the pulse of the patient. It's called Back Through Time. Like the plague doctor dispensing the mag magic, I move among the victims. They open. They swallow. Like him, I deal only with the here and now, the stomach's gripe, the blinding nausea that may come before or follow. It is just as though I, too, were wearing the full-length leather gown of medieval power, but minus the honorable gloves, the bird hat, its coned nose filled with antiseptic to protect me now, of course, but especially at the hour. When I was there, I was very much mindful of my father, uh, who, who uh, died in uh, 1954 at age 45. For a long time, I would have discounted the fact that it had anything, his death, uh, to do with my uh, going into cardiology, but I was a liar for a long time. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I was uh, mindful of my father is because of the old spiritual. Go down Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Spiritual. My father used to sing that refrain in the shower in Jackson, Mississippi in 1954. The year he finally got out of Egypt he was 45 years old. He died before coronary care, before the defibrillator, before lidocaine monitors, before intensive care nurses. They put him in an oxygen tent. They made the diagnosis just for show. They hoped the best for him. We let him go. Midway in the trip, one of the women, a, a theology student at Emory, uh, got very sick, so sick that she couldn't possibly continue on. And I saw her uh, in Amman and told uh, the director of the trip that we, she couldn't go on, she was too sick. And so we arranged, or he did really, uh, for us to see a doctor there in Amman, a man named Dr. Hemo, who was an OBGYN, uh, who gave us his uh, uh, office to give her some IV fluids. And while I was there, I found out that Dr. Hemo uh, is a, um, 
is a poet himself, and he wrote a, one of his poems out from right to left, and then in English from left to right. And uh, we had a bonding while Mary Sue was getting better. And I learned a lot about this, uh, the medical care and what it means in a foreign country uh, through, this, through the writing of this poem. It's called Caduceus. I go with a student in search of her health in Amman in Jordan. Mary Sue is sick as a sheep. The physician, Dr. Hemo, I like instantly. He is a gynecologist, I a cardiologist. Between us, I figure we make just about one general practitioner. <laughs> the bottle of intravenous fluids is hung high. Turkish coffee, sweet and hot, is brought for all of us, then sugary tea. The saline drips like a water clock. Its syrup says, hello, brain, muscles, skin, gut, hello, lungs. And the great paddle wheel of the heart kicks in, and the kidneys cry amen. Turns out Dr. Hemo is a poet, too. He says a poem of his in Arabic first, then English, a poem of first love long ago about the always need to say goodbye. We will try to draw the picture of sadness on the last page of the book. We will try to make it only a coincidence when we meet. He writes the poem out for me in both our languages, and as the fluid slows then stops, this coincidence of ours is over. We thank Dr. Hemo for coffee, tea, poems, electrolytes, and make our way out. Mary Sue leans on me all the way down the elevator, all the way to the car. One of the privileges of the physician is to hold triumph, love, and illness all together in his arms. But just before we leave, I remember to ask my most important question of Dr. Hemo. How should I imagine, how should I command healing in his native tongue in case I need it for the rest of the trip? Yeshvi, he says, smiling, glowing behind his desk. Yeshvi. I think that's what we have to do in medicine find the word for healing that the patient understands. Another area of the world that's given, been under such stress and trouble is France. And I went to France and for the first time just a few years back, and there I went to the Louvre and to the Tuileries, which uh, is French for a, a tile factory right near the Louvre, and this is what happened, called the Tuileries. From the Louvre, we hiked to Place de la Concorde, where 200 years ago, heads were lopped and rolled, grimacing. Beyond the grilled gates, we stumbled on the bustling gardens. The sun reflected blindingly up from the white gravel. In that desert, <coughs> We spun with a carousel, clung madly to the boomerang, ate, ate frites et saucis with Coca-Cola light, then rambled down the midway for ice cream. It was then I felt the slightest nudge at my back. Reaching for my shoulder pack, I found it halfway open to the world. I spun around to look for the enemy. They picked me out first with their six blinkless eyes, a human tableau frozen in the August heat, a dusty-faced mother and two sons, maybe eight and twelve years old. I might have called them gypsies without knowing what I meant. I expected them to run, so they didn't. They were still as garden statues, as if they had found their postures playing crack the whip the children's game in which no penalty came unless they moved. They stared like deer transfixed in the headlights of my eyes. They didn't move. 
as though they could hear in the distance the prison doors slam behind them, dead still as thieves at punishment, about to lose not only the cunning of the hand, but the hand itself. I clutched my bag and rifled it myself, my wallet, camera, my passport, all there. I knew then what was supposed to have happened next. With my pack partway open, a business-like jostle of my shoulder, a tourist, an easy mark, the jostle and the smallest hand among them would have found its way into the secret darkness of my pack. I thought only briefly to grab my camera and snap their cowering photograph, but no gendarme was anywhere about. Besides, I was afraid of the knife they surely had hidden among their flowing garments. In that moment, they sensed I'd given up. By imperceptible degrees, they began to move away from me, back into the crowd, as though re-entering the history of this place from which they had come. This place that was always theirs, as though they were stepping back into a pointillist painting, a rendering of these gardens by Surat, let's say, the painting that includes now this grove of trees by the garish midway from which they had emerged to confront me, their faces now taking on the shapes of leaves, losing their details in the green and human foliage until they are once again back in their element beyond pain or terror or crime or execution, their sentence only that they may not leave these gardens, their passports valid forever, still poor, still hungry, still waiting for the revolution. I have also learned a great deal from my mother, who in August will be a 98. She has uh, <clears throat> lost some memory, uh, but she is demonst uh, perfect demonstrations of Osler's equanimity, which he commended to all physicians. She rolls with the punches. Even if she doesn't understand the joke, she knows instantly when to, to laugh. And she knows when she's made a joke. One day we were sitting at lunch and she said, you are, I said, I'm, I'm Sonny, I'm John. And she said, how long have we known each other? I said, you're my mama. And she said, oh my goodness, when you birth somebody, you're supposed to remember them. I just want to read uh, three short poems and, and finish with that. She's been in the assisted care home for several years now. And uh, I call it, in this poem, I call it Serenity Gardens, which is not its real name, in case you wondered. Tuesday at the assisted care home. She loves the sun, and I don't like the sun. I am taking in the shade. She the sun. Together we are planning whole new lives. Then suddenly the spelling bee group from inside Serenity Gardens is upon us. They move outside en masse, six women and one man. She and I are surrounded and outnumbered, so we join in, I to listen, she to spell. I'd wager she is the oldest of this group, the spelling bee begins. At first, all the P words come her way. She spells with relish each in turn, easily mowing them down. Paisley, preference, parsonage, palisade. This woman is my only mother, now 93, who lives to sit in the sun, smiling out from under her great straw hat and lighting by Vermeer. If she is not this morning, the oldest here, clearly she is the most beautiful. Then the spelling rules change. Now she is to pick up a word beginning with the letter B, then spell it. She ponders. Blaspheme, she says, 
finally spelling B-L-A-S-P-H-E-M-E, blaspheme. Everybody is suitably impressed, you might say even startled. The woman next to me says in an unnecessary sotto voce, your mother is a great speller, but where do you reckon did she come up with a word like that? I have no idea, I reply, no idea. After popsicles, the party's over. The group disperses slowly with chair and cane. Nothing like a blasphemer among any of them, as far as I can tell. Then she and I are again alone together, both of us now brightly under the sun in its highest rising. Under her great straw hat and this lighting by Vermeer, she stretches in the heat. I speak to her dozing eyes, deep in brim shadow. You look a lot like Catherine Hepburn in that hat, in the African Queen, remember? Her eyelids flicker open. You can say that again. <laughs> and with a regal smile all her own, still aiming at a whole new life, she settles back and gathers unto herself the son and her son. <clears throat> We have about five minutes. Yeah. I, um, in, in the same year of the 9-11 catastrophe, I went by to see her in December. And I, I had a mission because I wanted to understand where she was along the, um, the conceptual uh, decline. And I, went, I got some information about my father, as you'll hear in this this uh, poem called Visitation. At Serenity Gardens, winter has surrounded us. My mother's room is way too warm for me, just right for her with an extra sweater. Outside, this uneasy year, her 93rd lurches through December. She is surely serene in this place, thanks to whatever goodness queen of the electronic piano. Among my chief duties now, I have become her human calendar, a stay against time, her reach for the past. Each visit, we review the years, we sit and we talk, fragile mother, absent-minded son. This afternoon, I assemble for her some semblance of my long-dead father, the only husband she had. I tell her his story. We study his photograph. Do you remember him? I ask. She looks again. No, she answers softly, no. But isn't he good looking? She smiles. I chuckle. In the gathering dark, we cry a bit together. I for what she has forgotten, she for what I remember. And I finish with this. Uh, the, the setting for this is having gone by a second time, very close to the first time that week, and uh, this is what she had said to me. This is the interaction that happened. It's called Noon Thursday. I dropped in on my mother, dazzling in her yellow sweater, having lunch. I sat down at her table. I had seen her two days ago, but this time I startled her, I think, too early in the week for another visit. You just appeared out of nowhere, she said, then asked me, smiling, what have you been doing all these years? I didn't know what to say. It's the very same question I've been asking myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 